Hey guys, welcome to the third episode of Office Hours, the podcast for Rocket Jump Film School. Today I have Will Campos and Mike Simons talking about the best movies to watch if you want to start getting into screenwriting. Um, so let's get into it. Rocket Jump Film School, scene one, Apple. Hey guys, welcome to the third episode of Office Hours, the podcast, and today we're talking to Will Campos and Mike Simons about favorite movies to watch to learn about screenwriting, which is kind of cool. I'm really excited about it. Um, so thanks guys for being here. Can you of course. introduce yourselves a little bit? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm Will Campos. Uh, I was the uh, one of the writers and co-creators of Video Game High School. I'm the senior staff writer here, and I also am the head writer on our new show, Dimension 404. Hey, uh, hey, everybody. I'm Mike. Uh, I've been working here a while, uh, also writing on D404, and yeah, just super excited. Yeah, awesome. Um, before we dive into it, uh, for the young aspiring writers that are listening or hopefully listening mm -hmm. to this, um, where's what are some good resources and places to start if they want to start learning about screenwriting and, and um, getting kind of into that? Um, that's a, opinion. that's a really good question. Uh, I, I feel like most of the, my beginning screenwriting career was ignoring books and teaching and just writing terrible crap over and over again. So I would start there. I would start by writing, just writing and figuring out what you like and just having fun with it as early as possible. Um, the, uh, the most important thing they, I remember we, they told us some quote in film school that you were going to write eight crappy, 10 crappy screenplays before you wrote one that was halfway kind of decent. And I think that rule more or less holds true. Um, so I think the first thing to do is, I, it can be, I think if you dive in too early on books and technical training and stuff like that, you you miss out on this like period of, and I go back and read a lot of my early stuff and I'm, you know, it's, it's sloppy and it's raw, but there's also some like real fire there that I even kind of miss now where it's, it's, you want to cultivate your own kind of flame and passion for it and get really excited for it. And my kind of experience was that I sort of, when I was starting out, was kind of resistant of traditional yeah. education in terms of writing because you're so early on, you're just trying to find your voice. And that's going to yeah. be something that has to come from a very internal place. Yeah. And it's going to be really instinctive and it's going to be something that comes out of, yeah, mm. just like all the movies you watch, all these kinds of things. You kind of know who you are. Mm -hmm. But the key is exactly what you said is just, write terrible screenplays, <laughs> just, just really get in there. Because that's the whole thing, is the one thing I, I can say you definitely don't want to be is someone who talks about wanting to be a screenwriter. Exactly. And, and so you really just want to dive in there, write, 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 don't worry about it, ingrain it into the rhythm of your day, like mm -hmm. get used to that process, like like really feed off of it, get a lot of like emotional satisfaction from doing it. And once you start there, then you'll just learn over the time of doing it and you'll learn good habits and bad habits and you'll read stuff and you'll, you know, then you won't read stuff and then you'll kind of go through this whole big process. But it really, really starts with ingraining it into just like your daily life. I, I would say, obviously, like you, you want to, that's, that's an, you, you do want to complement that with a bit of formal research, you know, like nobody gets to be a concert piano player without learning the fundamentals and the basics. Um, and so that, that, that part of it's equally as important as well. I would say the, the real fundamental book for me was Art of, Art of Dramatic Writing. Yep. Uh, by Egri, and then I was a big fan of Story by Robert McKee. That was the book to me. I went through film school, and I was talented enough that I didn't really have to learn a lot of technique. Like I had an intuitive sense, but you know, I got I got through four years of you know studying screenwriting without really even understanding what conflict was or how it had to be there in every scene of a script. And then I finally bit the bullet and I didn't want to read McKee because I heard he was like that. You know, he's the the ultimate screenwriting guru. You know, he, you go to L A the L A X you know Marriott convention center and he has these $2,500 seminars. I was like, I don't know if I need this in my life. But I finally read the book and I was like, oh, there's a lot of really, he, there's a lot of really interesting formal thinking about screenplays, structure and conflict and scene to scene reversals and theme that was, that really clicked for me. And, and, and I'll say this about like basically every book that's out there is there's really stuff you can gain mm -hmm. from every single book. Every single one of them will help you with like, oh, when you're getting into trouble with this, they'll break open your thinking. They'll give you a little tiny thing. You know, it's it's that one thing of not trying to think of anything as like, oh, this is the way. Yeah. You know, this book is my Bible. I have to have everything happen according to these page numbers and so and so and so. It's really more about just learning those little bits, tools. Yeah, really. exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I always like to yeah. think of those books as tools in a toolbox. You'll learn 
learn. You know, and even a phrase from a book that clicks with you, like when we're writing a lot, we'll talk about the stasis equals death moment from Save the Cat, or I'll reference like Robert McKee's like four quadrants of conflict and stuff yeah. like that. And you don't want to be too dogmatic about that stuff. Again, you don't want it to temper your passion or your intuition because some of the best moments in film are just surprises that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily they sort of break the rules. But it's good to have those tools in case you're trying to break a scene or you're yeah. trying to figure something out. And, and sometimes they can be a really funny one. I, I know we talked about it in the room, but uh, in the pilot for 30 Rock, uh, he's trying to bring Tracy Jordan onto the show, and the way he keeps describing it is calling him the third heat, but he's really bringing that reference from like a convection oven because mm -hmm. he worked formerly in ovens, and that's how he understands the world. So, like, we talk, but we, we talk, talk about, about the third heat <laughs> yeah. in the room. Where we're like, this scene needs a third heat, like, it needs a, another layer. So you're you're kind of using that stuff to build a vocabulary, and it also helps you again understand. It's a shortcut to really understanding the fundamentals of how drama and story structure work. Yeah. Um, yeah. So p find the tools that help you break through and and yeah. but don't get stuck in yeah. in yeah. to the point where you're not having fun. And we can do like a list of books and stuff that we recommend if you want. For oh, like that'd be the, great. Yeah. yeah, we can put that up on the blog or up on Film School or forums or something. Mm -hmm. That'd be sweet. Yeah, recommended yeah. reading. Yeah, there you go. Sweet. Yeah. We're getting we're getting legit. Yeah. <laughs> we're getting legit. Well, speaking of Thirty Rock and other things, kind of like that. Um, yeah. Let's kind of get into what you guys think is the the top movies to watch. For no. good screenwriting. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, and I will say that's that's like a really important part of it is because like because that's what movies end up being. You know, nobody sits around and they're like, oh, man, I'm going to read all the hot screenplays this summer. It's yeah. like they, they, you go to the movies. And, and so it's like understanding that relationship of how it goes into cinema is so critical. And just that's going to be your steady diet of learning instinctively how to tell Absolutely. stories. So so. I recommend being an omnivore in the first place and just uh, devouring yeah. them all. <laughs> it's interesting because when you guys pose that question to me of like, what are the you know really good, fun, you know like screenwriter like screenplay movies, my mind immediately left to some like sort of flashier picks like adaptation or uh, even a lot of the the stuff uh, you know like Quentin Tarantino or um, yeah. Richard Linklater. And I think that's usually when people think of a really good screenplay movie. It's kind of like you always have this thing that like the. Uh, at the Oscars, the one that wins the award, it's not best blank, it's most blank. So the actor who does the most acting wins, yeah. you know, best actor. The <laughs> movie with, that has the most editing wins best editing. Yeah. And those, there's movies that are like kind of people, I think people see them and they see like most screenplay. Like Adaptation is a great movie, but it's like someone wrote the shit out of this thing. It's meta, <laughs> yeah. it's self-referential, it's crazy. You look at, you know, Quentin Tarantino's bizarre structures and stuff like that and his obsession with just, in, in his incredible dialogue. Like, dialogue, I think, is what the, the lay person kind of immediately thinks of when they think of a yeah, screenplay. Right, right. So I wanted to, when I was thinking about this, I wanted to think of, like, what are the movies that really are much more about the foundational aspects of a screenplay that are kind of beneath the surface? Because great dialogue is great, but what powers a story is, of course, story structure, you know, th the expression of themes, drama, and conflict. Yeah. Um, so I actually wanted to start with, I guess we can ping pong. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, yours is great for first. I wanted to start by talking about a very recent movie, Mad Max Fury Road. Yes. Um, and I know uh, we've done like 12, so <laughs> 12 Fury Road podcasts at uh, Rocket Jump. Oh, there's going to be more coming. Yeah. <laughs> it's the movie, A, I think, it, again, if you know, in terms of something you can go out and see now that has a lot of modern appeal. And one of, one of, one of the things I like about it is it's a movie that its immediate charms are the action and the spectacle and the attitude and just the look of the whole thing and its energy. And I think what's so great about the movie is that it all comes from a really, really well-constructed screenplay that's doing exactly what it needs to do. Um, again, when you think of writing beyond just, I mean, again, it's got incredible dialogue. It's got, we've been quoting it for months now. They live, I die, I live again. The all of the Morton Joe stuff, the names and just the world, all that textural stuff is there and it's really terrific. But it's all built on two things that I think are great. One is just an incredibly simple and incredibly compelling story. Uh, that it sets up flawlessly. I think if you go through and you look at what every moment of that first act sets up and the way it does it in a quick and compelling and interesting way, it's terrific. And then I think the other thing that people don't really, it's so minimalist in how it expresses this, but I think it's in terms of, like one of the things I always struggle with with my writing is trying to express theme. theme. And I'm always impressed when a movie can really dramatize a theme. It doesn't feel like it's browbeating you, but it's there and it's omnipresent and everything. And Mad Max is like the qu quintessential <laughs> movie about this morality of survival. Like you're, you've got this character in Max, and again, people talk about how Furiosa is really the, you know, the star of the movie, but Max mm -hmm. is in a very real sense its protagonist. Yeah. And we start with him and it's this man as he literally lays out in the opening voiceover. And that's, I'll get onto a whole voiceover rant in a second. <laughs> but um, 
he's a man who is all his one goal is to survive. He runs from both the living and the dead. The opening moment is him crushing and eating this tube, this lizard and fleeing from people. And the movie is about surviving versus living, essentially. And it sets that up right away. You have this guy who is running from everything and looks out for no one but himself. And then in the way that the greatest screenplays do, through the, the, the machinations of the drama, he becomes a changed person by the end. And the way it expresses it is beautiful. Like one of my favorite moments in the movie is you've got this guy, he only looks out for himself, and then he winds up tied, lashed to the, to the post in this crazy chase. And then there's that moment where he's in the truck and he wants to just ditch Furiosa and the, and the, um, the brides and the car shuts down. And for the first time, he's going to have to get himself involved in someone's selfless, you know, crusade, like, you know, this moral play. He does, you know, he does it, it, at the beginning, he doesn't care about their plight, but then over the course of the journey and course of protecting them. And, you know, again, we get implications as to this tragedy in his past. He comes to care about other people again, which you then get in another brilliantly expressed, expressed moment when, and a lot of great movies do this where the character finally gets what what he wants. Mad Max has the, Max has this moment. He has the bike full of supplies. He could go off and be by himself in the wasteland, but instead he chooses to give up that to help Furiosa and uh, the rest of the crew survive. You know, do more than survive, and to you know head back to civilization and try to do some good. Um, and the way that that is that. Again, it's easy to point at the huge explosions and the guy with the electric guitar and be like, that's why I like the movie. But I think there's something that resonates with the audience on a deep level that makes that movie so endearing and so enduring um, that I think is really worth studying because it shows you how you can do a lot with a little. Uh, because all of that is very minimally expressed. It's not laid out in yeah. preachy sermons, but it's all right there all the way through. Yeah. And, and it, going off what you're saying is because uh, that's the main thrust of the movie for me. That's mm -hmm. everything. But the thing that I also love about it is a lot of times when, you know, I'll, you'll read a sci-fi script or somebody's like pitching me on a movie they want to make, they'll go into so much detail about the world and they'll mm -hmm. talk about the world and the mythology and the background and the setup and all these things. And it's like, yeah, that's important. Yeah, that's, I'm glad you thought of that. But what I love about that movie is it just starts and it goes. He tells you immediately, my world, my world is fire and blood. And all the things that you discover about the world just happen. They're happening along the way, and mm -hmm. it lets mm -hmm. you in over time. There's not a big explaining thing at the moment, like, in the future, blah, blah, blah. Exactly. You know? yeah. It's not trying to tell you things. It's just showing you the little peaks into the world along the way. Like, there's that great part where they're traveling at night, and you see the guys on stilts, and I'm like, what's that guy's world? Then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's great because you get this little peek into mm -hmm. it along it, the way. It's, I think it, it treats yeah. the audience as smart enough to figure it out. Right. It's right. like, yeah. this is, if you were dropped into this world, that's how you'd have to figure it out. Is exactly. Just look around, observe, see how people react to things and take yeah. your, their, your cues from them. Yeah. That's something I, I miss a lot in, especially in like sci-fi movies and other movies that have to establish something more alien yeah. is that I, all my favorite sci-fi stories were just, just dropped you in and you got to discover the world as you went. Yeah. And it's, it's this, you feel yeah. kind of smart about it. You're like, Oh yeah, I get that. But then now it's just like a lot of movies don't trust the audience to be able to pick up on it. So they explain everything. Yeah. It's it's because Mil I think George Miller he's he's and again you see this in the way he could give less of a shit about the continuity of the world and like all yeah. the different movies and stuff but he's first and foremost concerned with telling a story about this guy yeah. you know what I mean and about these people and then he lets everything kind of flow from that yeah anyway not to turn this into oh, another no. big <laughs> Mad Max is the greatest movie on earth sermon so yeah yeah, uh, yeah. So no, no, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about one of the other great movies <laughs> on earth uh, and that's uh, RoboCop. So <laughs> Robocop. Robocop is, uh, uh, it's one of those things. It's, it's a perfect screenplay. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I mean, I could talk about many, many things in that movie, but the thing I'll sort of center on is economy. And I'll talk about the way every single scene is so tight and so focused. And so it like, if you watch that movie, Every single scene will accomplish something really, really quickly and tell you something really, really quickly and throw you to the next scene with a real sense of purpose, and it never stops. Um, there, it, there's an expression I'm going to use, a sports analogy, which is everybody's favorite thing at Rocket Jump. Uh, but, <laughs> but there's this old uh, um, 
uh, basketball team, the Phoenix Suns, they would play the seven seconds or less offense, where it basically meant you had to go up and get your shot off in seven seconds, and then you could just move on from there. And the whole idea is through getting a lot of opportunities, you're going to be able to score a lot. Mm-hmm. It's, it's this weird thing, but it's this way I kind of like to think about screenwriting in some ways of, of – you can have really big, long scenes that explain everything, but when I go to the movies every summer, like every single scene has probably 40% fat on it. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like every single long dialogue scene in a big a summer action movie. It, it, it's, there's this, they're not caring about moving things along in a really economical kind of purposeful way. And, and keep in mind when I say that, I, it's, it's not a do or die thing, but it's a sense of... No, having a real sense of purpose in the scene and trying to get there mm-hmm. in a, as fast and and sort of economical way as possible. So what, like, what's an example of a scene from RoboCop that you think accomplishes it? Um, I, I was going to say is uh, one of my favorite scenes is um, really, really simple, and it's really early on, but it's um, the boardroom scene, which... <laughs> <laughs> for mm, a lot classic, of yeah. yeah, but it, but it's it's the way that it sets up and it goes into that scene. It's like you're following these little side characters and you have no idea who they are. But really, within it's only a couple minutes. Like like you're sitting there and you know the two guys are complaining about their other boss. Boss walks out of that, and they, again, that's a great symbol of of bringing in conflict. And they were just talking crap about that boss, and then all of a sudden they go into that um, next scene in the boardroom. And the uh, the the uh, it obviously goes horrendously wrong, and everybody dies. But like it totally upends the entire nature of this company within just a few minutes of screen time, mm-hmm. and sets the new stakes of where everybody is at and how it affects all the black, bad guys' plots going forward. And it's really entertaining and hilarious. and well, and it's also the it's the it's the piece that actually literally leads directly to the next beat, which yeah. is Alex Murphy showing up at his new job, right? Because and it's an it, it sets up the interesting relationship between these corporate oligarchs and yeah. this sort of man on the street yeah. who is the unwitting victim of all of this corporate skullduggery that's yeah. going on, which and, again and, is setting up a lot of the themes of the script as ex- well. Exactly, and it's and it's a very complicated scene. They're doing a lot of things, and they're mm-hmm. establishing who three people are you've never really seen before, and it does it so well. Yeah. And, and again, it's the main thrust of what this hero is going to get thrown into for the rest of the movie. And mm-hmm. by understanding those three people, you can just watch Murphy kind of go from yeah. there. Yeah. Um, I feel like now that we've done two pulpy genre films, we should do like, like yeah. one. Like, <laughs> so we've established some actual, you know, bona fides. Uh, the other movie that leapt immediately to mind was Casablanca. Yeah. Um, uh, for not maybe not maybe for the reasons people would think. For one, I mean, I, the, the the inherent immediate screenplay charms of the movie are obvious. Like the dialogue is incredible. Um, the uh, characters are really well drawn. Well, everybody makes up Ilsa. Uh, Ilsa's kind of a swing and a miss as far as the doe-eyed, you know, uh, rom- female romantic interest as prop goes. Like she's literally, you know, the, the literally yeah. at the end of the movie he gives yeah. her up because he's like, you'll you'll sex up this Laszlo and make him feel better as he's doing his important man work, which is like a little. <laughs> I mean, like that's again, it's it's of its time and it's problematic in that sense, but. The thing I really like about the movie, again, a a la Mad Max, you have a main character whose change is beautifully expressed over the course of the film. You know, uh, in Rick, you have the classic cynical, jaded loner, wounded by you know, uh, uh, you know, his lover leaving him at the beginning of this thing, uh, who sticks his neck out for nobody. And by the end, he again, that's the reason that scene at the uh, airport is so incredible, is so well remembered. Is not just that that scene itself is beautiful, but everything building up to it in the way the twists and turns on how uh rick approaches that are you know are i think fundamental um but the one thing i wanted to say about this movie is a point that a lot of people don't quite remember is i feel like there's a kind of obsession with plot these days and there's an obsession with again you'll see people nitpick the hell out of a chris nolan movie because oh well that didn't make sense with that and that and this and that um you know it's the, the christopher nolan effect that people always have is like they come out of the movie breathlessly you know thrilled and then they start nitpicking the plot and they find it doesn't quite add up and I always think that's unfair because I don't think it's a movie's job to necessarily present something that makes logical sense as long as it makes emotional sense Hmm. and to me Casablanca is the ultimate like emotional sense movie like there's a bunch of stuff in that movie that just is you're like what the 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 plot I think it was Ebert who said the plot is essentially a trifle to hang the emotions of the script on like if you think about what's going on it's really like like there's other it's it's famous for like not quite hanging together on a logic level but the emotions of it carry it and you're so swept along in the adventure that you don't mind um 
the uh, the movie literally has one of the classic lampshades. Like <laughs> it's the, the this like sort of fat, corrupt, like the rival club owner to uh, Rick uh, just gives away these letters of transit to uh, Laszlo and to Ilsa, even though he has no reason to. And as he's doing it, he goes, "Normally, this sort of thing is against my character, but for some reason, I feel compelled to help you." Like, and they just <laughs> and you just swim in because the it, it's so charming and the uh, and and again he knows uh, the the, um, the the movie knows how to uh, like how to carry the drama along of it and doesn't get as bogged down on the details which is something i always re found remarkable about yeah. it um, in addition to having great characters and everything else yeah. um, and then also it's a uh, to me a sign of like that climax is such a simple gesture you know and, and yeah. a, a climax in a script doesn't need to be a gigantic shootout or like something overly melodramatic like you know the a, it, it, you can accomplish a lot with a little, and um, that's another thing that I think is worth worth uh, yeah absolutely keeping in mind yeah um, that a movie can just come down to a guy letting the girl he loves go yeah. um, and not have to be about uh, you know you, it, it's not like he's getting into you know the, the easy thing would be to have Rick get into a shootout with the Nazis and yeah. you know kiss Ilsa goodbye and then drive the car into an airplane and blow it up but it's like who needs that <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no and, and I like what you say is specific, specifically that word gesture. And I mm -hmm. think that's a great way of sort of thinking about things, it, ways characters can give little signs to each other that, that something is transpiring and changes are happening. Even going back to Mad Max, there's a lot of little gestures in that movie yeah. that are the big crux of their relationship as they, they evolve. Oh, two, people, two people trying to help each other. Now, that's not to say, obviously, that you shouldn't, that your plot can just make no damn sense whatsoever. Like, right. obviously, <laughs> you want to have consistency. Yeah. But it is, I think... You, you, consistency, you, your plot has to make, it has to hold enough water that it's not going to take anybody out of it. Um, but beyond that, I think people th start to, they, they think about the plot more than they think about, the plot should be serving what you're trying to do with the characters and what you're trying to do with the story, not the other way around. Yeah. To, to use the phrase, is logic is the beginning of reason, not the end of it. So yeah. there you go. <laughs> yeah, I've noticed the movies that have a very clear and, and well-structured plot, if their main character doesn't change at all or goes nowhere. It's, it doesn't feel like anything yeah. happened, mm -hmm. even though tons of things, quote, happened, unquote. Right. Exactly. It's yeah. like, what's the point? Right. But if you have a, a person who goes on a journey, yeah. um, then it feels like much more is at stake and much mm -hmm. more is happening. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. something actually is happening for yeah. your character. And we have a very loud we cricket a, we in here. We have a cricket in the audience. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's just hanging out. Oh, oh there he oh, goes. There he goes. <laughs> um, uh, so Casablanca. Yes. Oh, next, next one. Next, uh, I'm, next one. I'm glad you Fit uh, all these in here. brought up Nolan, actually, uh, and because I wanted to talk about Inception, which is again one of those movies that people like watch the first one, like, wow, that was great, and then they started nitpick mm -hmm. nitpicking and doing those things. Uh, but the thing I wanted to talk about specifically with that um, is exposition. Um, mm -hmm. because it's one of those things that people hear, they hear like, oh, you don't want to use too much exposition. That's bad. That's, that, that's wrong. They're like, seeing exposition in, in movies is bad. That's really not the case. It's sort of a thing where he actually does exposition really well, and there's a reason people were entertained during the first half of that movie. Um, and it's because he, not only does he tend to make it cinematic, um, and he does it with a real sort of breathless pace and understanding, but he understands that exposition has to have purpose, um, and that's really the engine of how that movie ends up working. Like that entire first half of that movie is him explaining things that you'll actually need to understand the, the heist when it happens. Mm -hmm. And when the heist starts, there's very little explaining. It's just going. And from, and it's like I say, is that's the way I like to think of exposition is like, oh, you don't have to fill in everything, but it's like, what does a person need? And that's what I kind of like seeing in that movie. It's, it's a really great way of moving one way to the other. Even in another one of his movies, Dark Knight, is what he's kind of doing is, you know, it's a movie that doesn't make any sense when you pile all the scenes together, but he's very, very good at explaining, okay, we're here, now we're going here because of this. And then you go into that next scene and you're like, oh, I understand what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> and, it's just, yeah. and you can always get pulled one step into the other. And so it's, I, I think it's something he gets knocked for, but I don't think it's the fair thing to knock him for. There are other things to knock him for, but, but that's not one of them. <laughs> for, um, for those who are unfamiliar, what exactly is exposition? We're going to have a video about exposition. Oh, oh. Ass video. Expo exposition but is... In a, um, quick, a quick sentence. Uh, exposition is basically the way you're conveying information to an audience. Like, uh, yeah, that to, they need to know. That they need 
need to know. Like, and again, in Inception, the, the rules of this world are so complicated in terms of like, oh, you go into this dream, but then you can go into a dream within the dream, and then time goes slower in that dream. And mm -hmm. it's all stuff that needs to get explained to the audience for his incredible finale to work, for people to be on the edge of their seat while a van is falling in slow motion <laughs> in the river and understand that that's yeah. a ticking time bomb. Yeah. He needs to get all that information out. So then the art of exposition is how do you make that information not boring. They not, you know, it's like, uh, how do you make it compelling and interesting to an audience and have them, you know, get them along with what you're doing and have them understand everything in an economic way that isn't, that's still keeping yeah. the momentum. Showing the and, yeah. and you want to use the same tenets of screenplay. You want to show, you mm -hmm. want to have dramatic moments. You want the exposition to come out in conflict and all yeah. those kinds of things. And yeah, it does it pretty well. Um, my third movie uh, was to, maybe on the exact opposite end of the spectrum from uh, ex from uh, Inception was uh, the Big Lebowski, uh, yes. which has been <laughs> a, maybe almost the movie that made me want to become a writer. Like I, yeah. I watched it over and over and again in high school. It's like my favorite movie of all time. And what I wanted to specifically highlight about the Big Lebowski, a again, there's the obvious, there's the incredible dialogue. Which and if you go and read the script, which I recommend that you do, and we can post again a link to the script. Mm -hmm. um, all of that stuff that seems like it's effortless improv or riffy banter is like verbatim in the Coen Brothers screenplay, like down to the ums and re repetition and stuff. Like it's all almost exactly what they wrote, which I think yeah. is incredible. They're very deliberate. Yeah, um, very methodical directors. filmmakers. Yeah. Um, and but the thing I kind of wanted to point out about it, it's a movie at first blush that seems to be about nothing whatsoever. You watch it the first time and you're like, a lot of I mean, a lot of people don't like it the first time. They go, what the fuck was that? Like, what, <laughs> what am I watching? Um, but then it's a movie that reveals more and more of itself to you as you go along. And the uh, again, to, um, I, going through the script, I was surprised, like a lot of these other great screenplays, how much every scene moves you to the next. And despite the fact that at first glance, you're not quite. You're not you're 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 so caught up in the lackadaisical texture of it. These this stoner hanging out with his friends and bowling. It seems to just be going nowhere. But each scene again is moving you very purposely from one thing to the other, and all of the plot is being developed. And again, it's almost like a mad. It's almost like an illusion. You're you're so ra you know dazzled by the silliness of the dialogue and these fun characters that you don't really understand what plot stuff is going on underneath the table. It's like a sleight of hand. And I find that really incredible. Uh, and to me, it serves as a really good lesson. Well, two things. One, if you want to talk about the lowest of low stakes movies, it doesn't get any lower than this aging hippie trying to get his rug back. Um, <laughs> yeah. And obviously like his life gets imperiled in certain parts, but the way that that whole third act brilliantly unfolds in this twist that, oh, that guy's a bum too. I just didn't realize it because he's dressed up like a rich person. Person. And, you know, the way it just kind of all fizzles out is just, again, I think sort of beautiful and poignant. And then the way it sticks the landing with, with Donnie's death, spoiler, spoiler alert, yeah. um, <laughs> and how heartfelt that manages to be, I think is great. But um, to me, it's this real lesson that I think a lot of indie filmmakers could look to in terms of that just because your movie seems to be about nothing or you want to do a movie with low stakes that has, uh, you know, that's more about characters and quirk, the drama still needs to be on point and it still needs to be there in every single scene. Mm -hmm. um, even if it's below the surface, even if the texture of it is laid back and hanging out and very human, that's not an excuse to get sloppy with the way you're presenting your dramatic conflict. Like you can go through pretty much every scene in The Big Lebowski, even some of the weirder ones that are kind of more tangential. And even if they don't literally have conflict present, they are moving things forward and they're establishing conflict. Um, and all that yeah. information even comes back. It's, it's amazing how few, like because every scene feels like a digression, yeah, yeah it's actually not. Of, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's like it's actually uh, it, it, the way I like what it is. It's it's totally a Raymond Chandler story. Yeah, it's just you have a hippie guy who doesn't care about being in a Raymond Chandler story. It's just it's and it's not that even that it's happening around him because he still is making very direct choices based on he, what he wants in each scene. Mm -hmm. It's just there's a disconnect between his situation and yeah. what he wants, the, and that's that's an additional conflict. That's mm -hmm. what drives the movie. That's a great way of saying that every scene feels like a digression, but it is. Yeah, and I think that's something that's that's a really tough act to pull off. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I think it's easy to take a, the wrong lesson from the a movie like The Big Lebowski and be like, oh, I'm just gonna have funny characters and throw it, fill it up with swear words and have you know goofy nonsense going on. But it's, I, I would encourage people to watch that movie and really take a look at it and use pen and pencil to be like, what does the dude want in this scene? What is the obstacle to what he wants? How does the scene end and how does that throw to the next scene? Because yeah. I think you'll be surprised by how tight the structure of the film is. And I think that's a good lesson for people to learn. I want to rewatch that now. Yeah. Great. Uh, well, 
I think we have one more time for one more. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, the last movie. <laughs> I'm actually calling an audible now that I'm thinking about Uh-oh. it. Uh-oh. Because I thought, <laughs> oh, no. Uh, I was thinking about, because you mentioned Tarantino before. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's, again, he's one of those flashy writers that a lot of people are attracted to and mm-hmm. wanting to be. Like, the, the chance of somebody being able to sit down and write dialogue like Tarantino is very, <laughs> very mm-hmm. well. He's very good at what he does and having these long, drawn-out sequences of dialogue and all these sort of things. But the thing I actually wanted to highlight um, was what he does on a structural level is he'll have these very long scenes because the thing I think he understands and doesn't get enough credit for is the stuff he leaves out Mm -hmm. Um, because he's very good. His movies will essentially be these five chunks. Like he'll have these little five act movies that in between each act, he'll jump forward in time and, and, come into the story at another part they're very very episodic in that sense Mm -hmm. but he does that in a very very interesting way that allows him to tell these very big long scenes um it's sort of the exact opposite of what i talked about as being good in robocop um it's sort of but but i'm saying it is like you you kind of have to understand what you're doing and how you're playing with time you can have a big long again sequence that seems like a digression like if it's in kill bill you know you're getting this entire um uh origin story of over but it all builds up to the conclusion of when the her and the bride face each other you know mm-hmm. what i mean and he he's very good at understanding what he needs and doesn't need to tell the story and it's mostly because he'll tell little five like five little short stories that interlock to a greater purpose and that's the way i think he he understands when to have a long digression that's truly a digression but again it's that same point is ultimately it has a place where it's going i feel like the perfect example of that is the christopher walken watch scene in, oh yeah in pulp fiction where yeah. you're seeing it and again he gives it to you free of context he doesn't mm-hmm. he just <laughs> you're like what the you what the fuck is this it's just in the middle of the movie christopher walken is talking about hiding this watch up his ass in a uh, in a yeah. vietnamese uh, at pow camp yeah and then it cuts to bill i mean to a butch waking up yeah. and then but then when in, in what could otherwise be a really difficult thing to pull off, like if you were to have to lose that scene and then just have him have to explain why that watch is important when he goes back for it later, it would feel really inert. That incredibly long monologue is really setting up how important this thing is to this guy. And you yeah. understand and are compelled by it yeah. when it happens. And at, again, it's that magic trick of at first you're like, what's going on? Why am I hearing this? And, and I think he's like, playing oh, with that. Yeah. And then when it comes back later, you're on the edge of your seat because you get why it's so important to this guy and you get why he's going to walk into hell itself to go get it yeah yeah no. Well, no. awesome yeah um i think we're gonna have to wrap it up okay but, uh, that's okay but we'll we'll Man release Arnold quickly <laughs> breezing by in the background there goes matt <laughs> um so we'll post a list of the movies we talked about here and then um maybe get some notes from you guys and yeah, then we'll absolutely definitely be up for chatting with you guys in the forum if for you sure. have questions any other recommended watching and recommended reading we can throw up there as well mm-hmm. uh thank you guys so much for donating your time oh we're talking about, we're happy we're talking to, about yeah. movies this is awesome um and uh yeah we'll see you guys next week we're gonna be uh coming live from vidcon we're gonna be live streaming and then mm. upload this um later to the channel so we're gonna be talking about some cool stuff very cool yeah. cool awesome. thanks see you guys Yay.